Okay, um, technical team, ready to go? Excellent, so hello everybody and thank you for being here today, Sunday in the end of the day, so I'm very happy that you made it. And um, although I think we are a little bit tired, although we have a party ahead of us, I certainly, I, I can promise you that you're gonna learn some very interesting uh, information about device neutrality today. So, uh, yes, for those who are watching that are visually impaired, I'm a white uh, man, beard, bald, wearing a, a blue um, uh, yeah, a sweater and jeans, and we are in a university room. Behind me there are some uh, blackboard and the presentation uh, board. So, uh, my name is Lucas Lasota, I'm PhD in law, and I'm a senior project manager at the Free Software Foundation Europe. And device neutrality is an initiative that we are being conducting in order to retain control over digital devices. And here at the Bits and Boyme, and a big thanks for the Bits and Boyme's organizers for, present, for, for allowing us to present this concept this year, we want to achieve a sustainable way to safeguard control over digital devices. So, uh, first we needed to contextualize uh, this talk, asking a question to ourselves. Are we losing control over uh, devices? And how device neutrality helps to re-empower and use control over technology? And in order to not make things very theoretical, I wanted to present a case study where we contributed, the FSFE contributed to the European Telecom Regulator um, on a study on sustainability in order to to show them that it's impossible, in fact, it's, it's possible to regain control over devices in a sustainable way. So, what we see here in this picture, uh, well, I think everybody is, has uh, some digital device at home. We see some people already working with digital devices here. We are using it for communication, for work, for internet access, and they are becoming more and more common in our life. But there is some have you already uh, realized that although we are using more and more digital devices, our ability to install the, the software that we want is diminishing. Although this computer, this smartphone, we call it a general purpose computer, we are not allowed to install software that we want. For an example, if you're using an Android phone, perhaps it's hard to install a different um, uh, App Store. If you're using iOS, perhaps it's even harder to install uh, a third-party app, to sideload an app, right? So I think what is happening today in the smartphone market is paradigmatic. What we are seeing here is uh, yeah, some data from 2018 and, well, four years ago. Uh, what we see here is that, um, well, yeah, uh, Android is uh, by far the most used operating system in the smartphone market, and surprise, the second player that iOS. And what we are seeing here, uh, well, this is explain uh, one one uh, important uh, piece for us to understand what is happening on the digital markets. Both of these operating systems are proprietary, right? So, um, and so although we are using, more and more people are using smartphones today and we use, uh, even for, for, for an example, to our relation not only of, of other people but with the state and we need the smartphone to do everything, well, this, the, the main operating system on, on those devices are proprietary, so are not, it's not free software. So this is, I think it's a, it, it's a problem. If we see what is happening also in the browse market, and browser, it's a very important program to access the internet, right? So what we see right now is that 10 years ago, uh, we had some different players. We had, for example, the Internet Explorer, Mozilla Firefox, and Google Chrome. But in this year, what we see is the complete uh, dominant position from Google Chrome, the entire world, right? So, um, and again, through the browser, we access the internet. So, browser has add-ons and has other functionalities that shape our experience when we enter the internet. 
And I have some bad news for you, because those companies, uh, they have very strong commercial interests that sometimes they sell this interest to end users saying, oh, this is a security concern, this is a privacy concern, but in fact, when we start analyzing, these are just commercial interests. But, well, so, those companies that um, they dominate some very specific niches of the digital markets, for example, the operating system, the browser, the app stores, uh, we call them gatekeepers because they have control of very important nodules, very important bottlenecks uh, in the internet, the internet uh, uh, value chain. And when they control this, uh, this kind of nodules, they can control the experience of end users when they are accessing the internet, right? So, and how they exercise this control of end users? Basically, they restrict software freedom, as I said, right? Uh, limiting users to install different uh, operating systems, browsers, app stores, and drivers. However, they also lock devices down by controlling pre-installed apps, uh, hindering interoperability, and applying proprietary standards on those devices. And last but not least, they also control uh, end users in a so-called wallet garden by increasing switching costs, restricting end users on these ecosystems, right? To tie devices to online accounts and services, hampering control over personal data. So all uh, these sources of power of these big companies uh, uh, exercising what we call a gatekeeper control. Well, and this... Uh, it's obviously, obviously a huge problem for end users' freedom, right? Because when they hamper all those uh, rights, end users' rights uh, over devices, we are losing individual autonomy, we are losing digital sovereignty, and this has, of course, a backslash, a, a, a great negative impact on digital sustainability. And how to re-empower users to control technology in a sustainable way? This is a major question. This is the, the, uh, uh, the subject that we have been working on the last few, uh, few years, and we wanted to, to share our concerns here with you today so we can think on, on some solutions together. So, um, Cory Doktorov, um, I like this, this author very much, and he has a very interesting saying on this book, How to Destroy Surveillance Capitalism. And he says, the impact of dominance far exceeds the impact of manipulation and should be central to our analysis and any remedies we seek. So if we want to talk about sustainable way to regain control over device, we need to talk about the size of these big techs, right? And we, we need to start thinking on ways to disentrench this, those big techs on these positions of dominance they have on digital markets. So we have been thinking together with academia and we've been pushing forward this concept of device neutrality forward in a way to provide access to free software and devices and then regaining control of these devices. Device neutrality prevents discrimination of services and apps by platform, platforms or hardware providers, as we said, gatekeepers. And the main object of this concept, the concept of device neutrality, is to resolve the monopoly on devices by safeguarding users with alternatives. So we want to safeguard alternatives to reach software, services, and content with their devices. So people can, in fact, use their devices as general purpose computers, not in the way just that the big tech wants us to use the devices. And in order to achieve that, we think that we, uh, uh, any uh, uh, device provider uh, should abide under these three principles. Um, the software freedom, no vendor lock-in, and end user control over data. Let's talk a little bit about more of which one of these principles. By software freedom, we understand that users should have the ability to install and uninstall any software, including operating systems and app stores. This is a very strong statement, and um, I, I reassure you that sometimes big tech, they don't allow users to do this with, your, uh, with their own devices. But gatekeepers should also provide to third-party software the same access privilege to, 
as the pre-installed ones. So basically, what we are saying is this: Okay, so uh, pro providers, uh, device providers, they are selling a device on the market, but sometimes they comes already with pre-installed apps. And what we say, software freedom is this: We want to install third-party apps, and we have, the, we must have the same uh, uh, um, uh, privilege and access as the pre-installed ones. Well. Um, and what we mean by no vendor lock-in? Basically, gatekeepers, these big tech companies, should provide interoperability based on open standards, right? Uh, for, for people that are involved with the free, software, free and open source software community, this sounds common knowledge, but when we go to the reality of digital markets, this is far from being uh, um, a, a, well, a best practice, if, we, if, we, if you will. So the second thing that we think that's important for keeping uh, devices open and away from vendor lock-in is providers of operating systems should make available specifications for APIs and functionality invoked by third-party apps, and devices should not be bundled with app stores and online accounts. I think it's paradigmatic when you buy a smartphone. The, the first, uh, yeah, uh, uh, the first thing that appears on your screen is that you need to 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 open an online account with this big tech. I I I like more these very old uh, smartphones that we don't need any kind of online online accounts whatsoever. But yeah, so I, I think that one way to disentrench these positions is also to forbid this kind of practice. And let but not least. Um, well, uh, we need to reassure that end users have control over their own data, right? And end users should easily transfer personal data from apps and operating systems and devices. And gatekeepers uh, should be bound to open standards and common interface for data transfer. Right, so um, by now I think this is uh, a little bit too vague and perhaps a little bit too, uh, too theoretical. And, but I would like to, to say to you that we are very happy that we have been pushing uh, those concepts already on the legislative level on, in the European Union and the latest uh, law, the Digital Markets Act. There's a lot of pos positions and provisions on device neutrality and we are very happy with that. But today I would like to present you a case study from the telecom sector. Uh, and um, I would like to talk a little bit about router freedom. Uh, from the audience here, uh, who has internet at home? I think, yeah, uh, great, almost everybody. The second question is, who use the router, this equipment here, provided by the internet service provider? So, yeah, okay, so you just uh, ordered the internet and you are using the... So who bought your own router? Oh man, this is really cool. This is cool from this audience and from Bits Environment that, yeah, uh, the resonance from... Uh, is, is, I are already talking in other venues and the result is the, the opposite. So everybody was using the, the, the router from the ISP. So um, in the FSFE, the Free Software Foundation Europe, we have been monitoring. Uh, this is the link to the monitoring map. Since 2013, um, the ability of end users, consumers, to use their own routers, right? This is very important. Perhaps, uh, um, perhaps people may just think this is a useless device that you just use to connect to the internet. It is, it's covering on dust, on some, uh, it's hidden there in our home, but Ladies and gentlemen, this device is the gateway to the internet, right? So this is very important. This is where your home network is concentrated. So um, we think that it's very important for end users, for consumers, to have the ability to buy their own routers and to install their own operating system on their routers, right? But this is not the reality in the, in the European Union. So in our monitoring map, as you can see here, we have uh, the red uh, icons and we have the green icons. And the green icons is the, are the countries where we have the possibility to buy our own routers. In other countries, it's not allowed. You must use the, the, the routers from uh, the ISPs. And this is a problem for sustainability, right? Because if we, th if we think about using our devices for longer, the right to repair, and uh, extending the lifespan of our devices, and all those elements that are important for digital sustainability, if we are not uh, 
able to use our own devices, this is a big problem, right? And this is exactly the case study that I would like to propose and to say, look, um, the um, uh, uh, Barrick is the, um, is the European regulator for um, telecommunication, and, he, uh, and this organization proposed a study on sustainability, uh, asking for stakeholders to, to provide some solutions and feedback on the sustainability of, of the, the telecom sector, and we said, look, you need to do uh, your homework, because uh, what we have been seeing is that in the telecom sector, uh, it's not, today, it's not sustainable, because we are, people are not having the possibility to use their own devices for internet access. So, uh, and what we said first, that in order to fix this, in order to provide uh, solutions for a more sustainable uh, telecom sector, First of all, um, we said that free software licensing are, is key, I'm sorry, is key to enabling repellability and extending usage lifetime of electronic devices. The second principle that we uh, identified and pinpointed to the regulator is that the universal right to install any software or any device and the publication of source code of drivers, tools, and interfaces are fundamental for extending device lifespan. And now, connected to our presentation, device neutrality is necessary for a non-discriminatory environment for digital services and software application in devices. Right, so um, this is a very uh, uh, real-life example of how device neutrality can regain, help us to regain control over devices in a sustainable way, right? And, uh, and more on a more social level, uh, this was an inst institutional policy and legal uh, level, on a, on a more social level, we have been putting forward also an open letter that has been already uh, signed for, for more than 100 organizations uh, on the universal right to install any software on any device, right? And we have pro proposed some principles. For an example, the universal right to install any software, free choice of online services providers, interoperable and compatible devices, and publication of source code of drivers, tools, and interfaces. So these are some of the concepts that we have been pushing forward in pro of device neutrality uh, in order to, to help people to achieve, to regain their control over devices in a sustainable way. Well, basically, this is the, uh, the presentation that I have for you today. And um, thank you very much for the attention and looking forward for your feedback. What do you think about device neutrality? <laughs> Any question, comments, or are you happy? Oh, yes. Uh, just one question. Perhaps we'll wait for the microphone. Great. Is it working? Can you try that? Hello? Yeah, it's working. Okay. Um, I haven't seen the Firefox browser on your graphic in the beginning, but maybe you mentioned it earlier because I wasn't here in the start. Uh, you said Google Chrome is basically taking over the world, but there's also alternatives. Mm -hmm. um, I just think you should mention it at least that there are other, there's another browser engine that's not Google Chrome, basically. Uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely. And then another thing that I find, I mean, there are, you are, I think, basically right, but there are also other devices that are better now because there's, for example, the Steam Deck. Mm -hmm. You probably know this is kind of a gaming console mm -hmm. that is uh, using Linux, for example, as a, as a base, and that's something completely new, mm -hmm. and it's comparable to PS4 or Xbox and stuff like that. So in this regard, they can install all kinds of software, Linux software, and uh, so I think in some regards, the situation is also getting better. Right. So maybe it's also an idea for, for the FSFE to, to promote cases in which the situation actually gets better. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot for your comments. Uh, yeah, I completely agree with you. Um, this presentation of this data here, it's not so ever just uh, the acknowledgement of we are happy with the situation right now. Uh, on, the, on the contrary, I, I, I think this is a, a problem. And um, 
Yeah, but there is, of course, uh, a lot of uh, solutions. And basically, I'm not using uh, Chrome, and I, I think a lot of people are not using it. But the sad reality is that uh, Chrome has the, a serious advantage on the digital market. And in order to, to break that, we think that we need to talk about the size of Google company, uh, Alphabet. And in order to disentrench uh, Google from this position, we need device neutrality. So this is the main argument today. Yeah, we, we have some questions here, please. Thanks. I know this is a very big question, but I wanted to ask how you think we, like, what are the possibilities? Because I know that, like, you, t you mentioned this EU policy uh, developments, but of course that's often very slow and there's a lot of implementational issues to it. So what are other ways um, in which we can like, foster a change? Uh, yeah, th this is an excellent question, and, and, and thanks for it. So yeah, um, our strategy is not to work only on the policy level, but also on, on a social level. right? So we are working with a lot of um, yeah, organizations. Even so, some, uh, even device manufacturers, for example, Fairphone has um, has, I think it, uh, Fairphone has uh, signed our, um, our open letter. But I think that on an individual level, if on an individual level, if you wanted to uh, avoid this problem, perhaps it would be nice to start seeking for alternatives um, on your smartphone, installing a different uh, OS, for example, Calyx OX or, or even different uh, alternatives. If you're using some uh, notebook, perhaps it's trying to install uh, a GNU Linux distribution. You know, um, there's a lot of them, and sometimes they are very easy, uh, very. E uh, user friendly, and I, I think on um, and helping us to spread the, the word. Right, we are working already on with a huge number of stakeholders, but um, we need still people to join the movement and to to spread the word and say, look, this is not right. Uh, I wanted to regain control over my device. I bought it, and I wanted to install third-party apps. I wanted to install a different uh, uh, application, and well. Basically, uh, if we spread the word uh, among our family, among our friends, uh, I, I think this has a, a very um, good impact on society. Yes, please. Great presentation. Um, mine is more just a comment. I find it very interesting. I wonder how this plays out in the foreign aid arena, because I, I, it reminds me of Facebook, for example, and this campaign that they had about uh, let's connect everyone to the internet, right? right. And they go to uh, developing countries where people are not connected and they give this Facebook uh, field yes. <laughs> devices where they can only have Facebook Messenger and no other thing. Like, and this is, of course, the incentives for the business. So I wonder, like, how would that play out in this? Yeah, uh, thanks. And uh, this is a very serious question, I, I would say, because uh, when we start seeing some data from developing country, and me, myself, I come from a developing country, I'm a Brazilian, and uh, the, how people are shaped, the, the, the experience, internet experience in, in, in Brazil is that when today, this generation, people from that, uh, that are born in, in 1990s uh, onwards, when you ask about the internet, they only know internet by or Facebook, by WhatsApp, uh, TikTok, or perhaps Instagram, right? So this is not the concept that we had on Web 2, that we have indeed the concept of open internet, right? And people that, in fact, uh, those big companies are using um, their power in order to shape the experience of end users with their de the devices. In order to change that, I think it takes some time because, it, it, it takes some time because well, big tech had almost 20 years to get the position that we, we, they got right now. And that's why I, we think that we need some very specific actions on the social level, but we need also the regulatory. Although the regulatory sometimes may, may take time, sometimes we need to, 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 to get majorities uh, on, on our parliaments and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. But we need to regain the regulatory space for ourselves again, because uh, big tech had 20 years of non-regulatory spaces in order to achieve that and we needed to regain those spaces in order to provide a better, better experience for end users. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention and I wish you 
All the best.